everyone, and uh, welcome to today's edition of Patcast. Today is uh, Tuesday, March 18, 2024. I'm Rifat Manan from California. Uh, we are continuing with our board review series, and today we have with us Dr. Gagan Mathur, who is the Associate Professor of Clinical Pathology at University of California, Irvine School of Medicine, and he is also the Medical Director for Transfusion Medicine there. And today he is going to cover uh, topics that are high yield for transfusion medicine. And as always, uh, those who are listening to the lecture, please feel free to post your questions on YouTube and Facebook chat windows, and uh, we will pass them over to Dr. Mathur at the end of the lecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mathur, for joining us today. Over to you. Good morning, Dr. Manon and everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, so as Dr. Menon mentioned, I am the Medical Director at Transfusion Medicine at UC Irvine <clears throat> and looking forward to this talk. So this, I don't have any disclosures. We will jump right into the, uh, the board review high yield stuff here. Uh, there is a lot of things that I will try to cover, but it's not inclusive of everything that might show up in Transfusion Medicine uh, on your board. Uh, I, as much I would love to go into the details of each and everything, I'll try to keep my discussion very superficial just to cover everything. But if you have any questions uh, or need any explanation on anything, please feel free to uh, message in the chat, uh, which I'll address at the end of the talk, um, as well as I'll give you my email at the end so you can email me directly if you have any questions. So let's get started. So for the the regulatory side of the blood bank, so FDA is the regulatory agency that oversees blood bank and transfusion medicine operations, and the regulations which are applied to us are under the Code of Federal Regulation CFRs, and Title 21 and Title 42 are the more important, are the ones that are applicable to transfusion medicine and blood banking because blood is considered a drug as well as a licensed biologic, so 21 and 42 title of CFR apply to us. Uh, FDA can come and inspect the blood bank themselves. <clears throat> other agencies that oversee uh, blood bank, as well as all the other labs in, in our hospital setting, is CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, and the regulations for the CMS, they are in the CFR for, uh, Title 42, Section 493, which is the CLIA uh, clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments of 1988. So the CMS oversees the lab and the blood bank under the CLIA. And unlike FDA, CMS does not come and inspect us directly. They have these agencies which are deemed, which have deemed authority from CMS. Um, and these are the accrediting agencies such as ABB, CAP, Joint Commission, and others which can come and inspect us. So the questions on the boards can be, will be, uh, what are the regulations that apply for us under CMS, then it would be clear. And what are the agencies that are, which have the deemed authority? So this question can come in transfusion medicine or general chemistry or general lab management section of the board. Okay, uh, next we'll jump into the blood donations. So blood donations, as we know, there are two types, the whole blood donation where you can donate a unit of blood or uh, and then there are apheresis donations where you're connected to this apheresis machine and then you can donate platelets. You can also donate red blood cells, especially you can donate two units of red blood cell, double reds uh, using apheresis and you can donate plasma and granulocytes. The donor qualifications always show up on the board. So the, the important questions that will show up are what is the minimum age for someone to donate? So age 16 or older uh, can donate. Uh, but in some states, 16-year-olds need parental consent. So if the question is, what is the minimum age to donate? The answer is 16. What is the minimum age to donate without parental consent? Then the answer will be 17. Uh, so keep that in mind. Blood pressure and pulse. So the blood pressure, uh, your blood pressure systolic has to be between 90 and 110 and diastolic between 50 and 100. Uh, for pulse, it has to be regular and between 50 and 100 beats per minute. So for both blood pressure and pulse, donors can still donate if their pulse and blood pressure are outside these uh, parameters, but then medical director approval is needed. So a question might be a 60-year-old uh, 
healthy athlete uh, comes to donate blood has a regular heartbeat of 45 can this donor donate so the answer will be yes with blood donor medical director approval temperature you don't have fever weight that can show up 110 pounds or 50 kilograms is the minimum weight you need to donate and then this next question will be what is the maximum amount of blood that can be donated in a whole blood donation and the answer is 10.5 ml per kilogram so that's an important one to remember uh, hemoglobin hematocrit hemoglobin 12.5 or more for female and 13 or more for male hematocrit 38 and 39 respectively uh, this usually show up on the board they might ask what is the platelet count for platelet donation so 150000 or above is for a versus platelet donation this slide is just the same information, but it's from an official source from ABB and it has more details. Um, autologous donations, questions regarding autologous donations also show up all the time. Uh, the patient has to have a order from the physician who's requesting autologous donation. There is no age limit, but the weight limit of 110 pounds or 50 kilograms still applies. Hematocrit changes, the minimum hemoglobin requirement and hematocrit requirement are 11 gram or 33% hematocrit. So that always shows up on the board. Um, you can donate up to 72 hours. You have to donate up to 72 hours before the surgery or scheduled transfusion because that's the minimum amount of time we need to do all the testing and infection disease testing and processing of the blood product. Units can only be used for autologous donation. They cannot move into general inventory, so they must be labeled with for autologous use only. Um, then units can, uh, you can donate up to every four to seven days before the surgery if you meet all the other requirement and can donate again. If the, there is a risk to the donor, the patient himself, herself, or there's a risk of bacteremia, then the autologous donations are declined. Donation intervals also show up all the time. The most important donation interval that you need to remember is for whole blood, you can donate every eight weeks or 56 days. Um, if you're donating double red, which as I mentioned earlier, will be through apheresis, then you will have to wait for 16 weeks. Uh, other ones don't usually show up, but platelet donations and the leukophoresis, which is a granulocyte donation that can show up. So for granulocytes and platelets, you can donate every two days but you can donate maximum two times in seven days. And then the most important thing is you can donate a total of up to 24 times only in a 12 month rolling period. So this 24 times limit that might show up on the board. Common deferral for donation. So medications always show up. So medication, uh, this is not a exclude like a all inclusive list. It's the most common that I think might, you should definitely know. Uh, so aspirin, two days, heparin, warfarin, seven days, and antiplatelet drugs like clopidogrel uh, for 14 days. These only apply to platelet donation. If you're donating whole blood, that does not apply. These deferrals do, do not apply to whole blood donation. But the rest of the list applies for all the donations. So finasteride, uh, propatia, or proscar used for prostate or uh, hair loss, one month deferral, isotretinoin, acne, treatment, one month deferral. So these two are important. Then the psoriasis medication, acetretinin, three years, and etitret uh, or tagesin, a permanent deferral. These are very important to remember. These show up. Um, antibiotics, if you are actively taking antibiotic, you cannot donate. But if you're just taking antibiotic for prophylactic uh, reasons for acne or heart disease, then prophylactically, you don't get any deferral. So they might ask a donation donor is taking prophylactically taking antibiotics for acne. Can donor donate? Yes, the donor can donate. The next slide is for uh, vaccination. And with the COVID vaccine, this might like uh, this became a very common question that we will get from the donors. So maybe it might show up in the board. So let's just don't uh, go into the COVID vaccinations. So COVID vaccinations are non-replicating, inactivated, or mRNA-based, and they don't have any deferral period for them. If you don't know the type of vaccine, uh, then there might be some deferral. But in the case of US, all COVID vaccines, there is no deferral for donation. Uh, for toxoids or synthetic or killed vaccines, 
there is no donor do deferrals like the uh, hepatitis vaccines or the um, diphtheria vaccines, pertussis, the tetanus, all these, there is no vaccination, no deferral period. Live attenuated vaccines like measles, mumps, there is a two weeks deferral. Um, rubella and chickenpox shingles, there is a four week donation deferral period. So these two are important. These remember the measles, mumps for two weeks, rub uh, rubella and chickenpox shingles for four weeks. These are important ones that might show up on the boards. <laughs> Infections like hepatitis, HIV, malaria, these sometimes show up. So if you have a confirmed present or past confirming evidence of infection for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, then you are permanently deferred. Uh, but if you don't uh, permanently defer, also if you have confirmed hepatitis surface antigen, repeat positive of core antibody or positive NAT, these are all permanent deferral for hepatitis B. For if you are living, if a donor is living with a person uh, with acute or chronic hepatitis B or had sexual contact, it's a 12-month deferral. Uh, same for hepatitis C, is 12-month deferral. For HIV, this was recently decreased to three months. So just remember that for hepatitis uh, B and C, a 12-month deferral, but for HIV, sexual contact or living with a person with HIV, that is a three-month deferral only now. Malaria, if you have a diagnosis of malaria, three-year deferral after the symptoms stop. If you lived in a country which is endemic for malaria for more than five years, there's another three-year de referral. But if you just travel to a mal malaria endemic country and you yourself don't live or the donor does not live in an endemic country, then it's only a three-month deferral. So three years and three months, depending on the situation for malaria. So this can show up for sure. Other random things that might you be asked on the boards for deferral, pregnancy, six weeks, uh, recipient of blood or blood components, three months. This used to be 12 months, so this has recently changed. So the blood component exposure or to human tissue exposure is a three months only. Sharing needles for non-prescription drugs also decreased to three months. Uh, exposure to mucous membrane to blood, also three months. So these were all recently decreased to three months. Uh, non sterile penetration, which also includes the tattoos and piercing, is also a three-month deferral if they are from a non-regulated ent entity. If, the, if you're getting a tattoo or a piercing from a regulated agency, like a, a, a state-licensed uh, tattoo shop, then there is no deferral. If a donor has been incarcerated for more than 72 hours in any kind of setting, it could be jail, prison, or other juvenile settings or other incarceration setting, a 12-month deferral, so that's an important one to remember. Recipient of dura matter or obvious evidence of parenteral drug use, that's a permanent deferral. So some of these might show up on your boards. Let's get into the blood products components and their processing. So as we, so, this is what we this is the full blood donation. So when the full blood donation is collected, that can be separated into different components. So you take the whole blood spin it, red blood cell or the packed red blood cells are separated out. The plasma, which is expressed out in a separate bag, can be called a platelet-rich plasma, which in certain settings, so 10% of the blood products that are out there, 10% of the platelets that are out there in US are whole blood-derived, WBD, whole blood-derived platelets, which come from this platelet-rich plasma, which you spin again and you separate out the platelets from there. Uh, but that's only less than 10%. Most 90% of the platelets come from apheresis setting. So in the 90% of the cases, the platelet, the plasma, which is separated out, is frozen. Uh, and depending on how fast it is frozen, if it's frozen within eight hours, then it's called fresh frozen plasma, which can be further used to make cryoprecipitate. But if the plasma is frozen within 24 hours, that is called plasma frozen in 24 hours. And I'll go into more into these terminology for various types of plasma in my uh, coming slides. So let's go into each one of these products and like, talk about the things that you might have to remember for the boards. On the top, I have the temperature settings that different products are stored at. So try to remember this. So when somebody says room temperature, that means 20 to 24. Fridge is 1 to 6. Transport is 1 to 10, freezer is less than or equal to minus 18 degrees, and deep freezer is minus 65. So 20 to 24 for room temperature, which will come up for platelets mostly. Remember that 
one to six degrees, the fridge is for red blood cells. And when they are transported, it, the temperature gets wider range, becomes wider to one to 10 degrees centigrade. So keeping that in mind, so let's get into the details of the whole blood that you might have to remember. So when we collect whole blood, so the we have two types of bags available in US. So there is either 450 ml bags or there are 500 ml bags. And both of them uh, can collect plus minus 10%. So that means like you might have a unit of uh, 450 bag can collect around 405 to 500, 495 ml. And the 500 ml bag can collect anywhere from 450 to 550 ml of the whole blood. And the 500 ml bags are most common in US. You don't have to remember this. Uh, low volume, I don't know if they can ask you to remember that when you are not able to collect this much volume, but you collect 66 to 90 percent, that means for a 450 bag, you are able to collect only 300 to 404 ml. Or for a 500 ml bag, you are only able to collect 333 to 449 ml. That product is called low volume. So I don't think they will ask you all these specific details of 66 to 90 percent. But the question that will come is if a unit of blood is collected, a whole blood unit is collected, which is found to be low volume, what can be done? What has to be done with that unit? Can you have to do you have to discard it or can you still use it? So the answer will be a whole blood, a low volume whole blood unit can be used to make red blood cell only. No other components can be made. So the only red blood cells can be made from a low volume whole blood unit collected. Plasma and platelets cannot be made from them. That's the question that will show up on the boards that uh, only red blood cell, no other components made from a low volume unit. A whole blood unit is stored at one to six degree, transported between one to 10 degree. Uh, and the shelf life depends on the anticoagulant, which is in there. So the anticoagulants in which whole blood, are, whole blood units are collected are either CPD or CP2D or a CPDA unit. So the shelf life is 21 days in CPD, CP2D, and the shelf life is 35 days in a CPDA unit. So these shelf life, you have to remember, uh, whole blood has been used more and more in the last few years, so that might show up, but the only thing you have to remember, the whole blood unit that we use right now are LTOWB, low titer group O whole blood. So that's the only type of whole blood that is used clinically for treating patients, and that is used only in trauma setting. So remember the low titer O whole blood, and the shelf life is 21 days in CPD, CP2D, and CPDA 35 days. Next product that we'll talk about is a red blood cell or packed red blood cell. I added another table on the top to talk about the various types of anticoagulants that are used. So there is an anticoagulant called ACD, acid citrate dextrose, CPD, which is citrate phosphate dextrose, CP2D, citrate phosphate double dextrose, and CPDA, which is citrate phosphate dextrose adenine. And then there is an additive solution, AS. So there are different types of additive solutions, which we don't have to go into detail, but AS is the additive solution. So red blood cells either are collected from apheresis or from the separation from the whole blood unit. And usually they are, the volume depends on the anticoagulant they are in. So if the red blood cell unit is containing only the anticoagulant, then their volume is around 225 to 350 ml and the hematocrit is between 65 to 80. So I don't think you have to remember the volume, but the hematocrit 65 to 80 percent or what is the maximum hematocrit of a packed red blood cell, 80 percent, that can show up on the board. So this is for a unit which is collected in anticoagulant only. But if a unit has additive solution added on top of it, so additive solution, as the name says, is added on top of these anticoagulant, so then the volume increases by around 100 ml. So then it becomes 300 to 400 ml unit. And the hematocrit, as expected, will go down because it's diluting the unit. And the hematocrit becomes somewhere between 55 to 65%. So uh, maximum hematocrit of a back red blood cell, 80% is what you can expect. Uh, other things I don't think should come, but just keep these in, these in mind. A question that can come is how much iron is in each unit of red blood cell? So approximately 200 milligram iron is present in each unit of red blood cell. Temperature at which red blood cells are stored, one to six degree, transported one to 10 degree. You have to remember that. 
shelf life depends on the anticoagulant. ACD, CPD, CP2D is 21 days. CPDA is 35 days. So these are similar to the whole blood. Then on top of that, when you add additive solution, it increases the shelf life to 42 days. And these are all multiples of seven, seven, three, seven, seven, seven. So 21, 35, and add more seven, 42 days. So you can try to remember that using that. Um, additional storage for details for red blood cell. If you have a rare unit, which is frozen, like deep frozen, rare red blood cell unit, it is frozen at lower than minus 65 degree, and it can be stored for up to 10 years. Once that unit, which is deep frozen, is, uh, is thawed, and that is called deglycerization, you have to remove the glycerol, which is present in the frozen unit, that is called deglycerization, which is done by washing the red blood cell, but we can also wash the units for other reasons, which we'll talk about later on. Then the shelf life of a washed or deglycerized red blood cell unit is 24 hours. So this can definitely show up on the boards. And irradiation, which we'll talk about a little bit more in, in a little bit, irradiation decreases the shelf life of red blood cells to 28 days or their original shelf life, whichever is earlier. So remember that 28 days or whichever is earlier from their original shelf life. Um, expected increment that can show up uh, on the board. So the one that you have to remember is the first one mostly from a red blood cell unit, one unit of red blood cell given to a patient, adult patient, approximately 70 kilogram. It can be a additive solution containing unit or just a uh, the normal uh, anticoagulant containing unit. It's just a full unit. So you expect one gram per deciliter increment in an adult. In pediatric setting, depending on if it's a CPDA unit or an additive solution containing unit, which has less, uh, which is more dilute, uh, volume given is approximately 10 ml per kilogram. Mostly in the boards, they will say a pediatric patient receives a 10 ml per kilogram red blood cell. If it's a CPDA unit, then you expect a three gram increment because this is more concentrated unit, 65 to 80 percent. But in a additive solution, which is a diluted unit, 55 to 65, you can expect a, three, a two gram increment. So this three gram I've seen before in some of the questions. So try to remember these number, uh, adult one gram per deciliter for pediatric patient, 10 ml per kilogram, approximately three with CPDA, two grams with additive solution containing unit. Then I added a couple of random facts down here, only solution that can be simultaneously infused with red blood cell like in the same tubing is the normal saline 0.9 normal saline which is isotonic that's the only liquid which can be infused in the same tubing simultaneously with red blood cell anything else dextrose any medication any antibiotics nope cannot be given with red blood cell that can cause hemolysis uh, after transfusion approximately 70 percent 75 percent of the red blood cells are viable in the circulation so random fact which might show up on the boards. Next component that we are, we are going to talk about is plasma. So I don't like to use the word FFP or fresh frozen plasma because those are very specific products. So umbrella term to use is plasma. And as I added the box on the top, there are various type of plasma products that are out there. So unless you know about them, use the word plasma only. So FFP is fresh frozen plasma. FP, PF24 is plasma frozen in 24 hours, within 24 hours after phlebotomy. And PF24, RT24, a mouthful, it's plasma frozen within 24 hours after phlebotomy, but it was held at room temperature up to 24, after, 24 hours after phlebotomy. So these are various types of products that are out there. I don't think they will test you on that, but they will definitely test you on FFP. What is the FFP? FFP is plasma frozen less than eight hours after phlebotomy. So that's the definition of FFP. Who are the donors that can donate plasma? So all male donors can donate plasma, but female donors only if they have never been pregnant or if they have been pregnant, they are testing negative for HLA antibodies. Those are the only ones that can donate plasma. Volume is not that important. Uh, the whole blood drive plasma units are smaller. If versus units are bigger, but I don't think these will be asked on the boards. Definitely, uh, they can test you on the shelf life and the storage temperature. So plasma is frozen and kept at minus 18 degrees centigrade for up to a year. But if you put it in the deep freezer, minus 65, 
which is only applicable for FFP, it can be stored for up to seven years. So minus 18, one year, that's the question that will you have to remember. Once you thaw the plasma, which is done at 30 to 37 degree using a water bath or there are some FD approved devices like microwaves, which you can use to thaw plasma. You can, once you thaw it, the shelf life of plasma after thawing is only 24 hours and it is stored at one to six degrees centigrade like red blood cells after it's thawed. So uh, then the other thing that they will ask is thawed plasma. A thought plasma is a relabeled product which adds four more days, a total five day shelf life of a thought plasma. And it is also stored at one to six degrees. So this is a confusing part that will show up. So as I decided to uh, explain the definitions of all these product, FFP, FP24, and PF24, RT24. So if they ask, what is the shelf life of FFP? What is the shelf life of PF24? What is the shelf life of PF24, RT24? after thawing answer is one day or 24 hour as long as they are asking for the shelf life of these specific names ffp pf24 then it's 24 hour but what is the shelf life of thawed plasma then you will say it is five days so thawed plasma is a separate product which is a relabeled product so you have a unit of ffp which you thaw and if you use it just like that, then it's good for one day only. But if you take the frozen plasma FFP, thaw it, and relabel it with a sticker which now says it is a thawed plasma, then it has a total five-day shelf life. And that relabeling has to happen within 24 hours. That's why it adds four more days. But if you take a unit of plasma, thaw it, and put a label on it right away, thawed plasma, it has a five-day shelf life. So the question, Again, what is shelf life of FFP after thawing? One day, 24 hours. What is the shelf life of thawed plasma? Five days. How many extra days does relabeling a product to thawed plasma adds? Four days. So this is a little confusing, but remember, but try to understand what I've written here uh, because that can cause some confusion on the boards. Then there is a new product out there called liquid plasma. Uh, which has been used in recent time for trauma setting and MTP settings, uh, massive transfusion protocol. Liquid plasma is a plasma which has never been frozen. So you collect the whole blood, separate the plasma, and this plasma which is separated, if you never freeze it and store it like a red blood cell, that is called liquid plasma. And that has a shelf life of 26 days and 40 days, depending on the anticoagulant which is five days more than the whole blood. So liquid plasma and whole blood, try to remember them together. So liquid plasma, uh, sorry, whole blood collected in CPD or CP2D has a shelf life of 21 days and the liquid plasma add five more days, so 26 days. Uh, whole blood unit collected in CPDA has a 35 day shelf life. Liquid plasma add five more days, becomes 40 days shelf life. So, and it's stored at one to six degrees centigrade like a red blood cell unit in the fridge. Okay, the next product that we want to talk about here is the, the platelets. So platelets, as I said, 90% of the platelets are apheresis and rest of them are, uh, are whole blood drive. So again, similar to plasma connected from, collected from males or females who have not been pregnant or negative for HLA antibodies. Uh, volume of red blood of platelets is not that important. Uh, important thing is the storage have to be stored at 20 to 24 degrees, that is the room temperature with gentle agitation and pH has to be about 6.2. So this is all important that you have to remember. Shelf life is five days, can be extended to up to seven days, but don't worry about that. Five days is the shelf life of platelets. It might be asked if the platelets are not being stored in with agitation, what is the maximum storage outside the agitation? 24 hour, very important part. What is the content, platelet content in a unit of platelet? A for this unit has at least three into 10 is to 11 platelet. Very, very important number to remember. Uh, if you can remember 5.5 into 10 is to 10 for each unit collected from whole blood, but three into 10 is to 11, very important to remember. Uh, increment, you can expect an increment of 30 to 60,000 with a, in an adult in pediatric setting, 50 to 100 increment. Not very important question, but yield is very important. 
next component is cryoprecipitate cryoprecipitate is <laughs> uh, collected from, is made from ffp fresh frozen plasma so fresh frozen plasma which is kept in fridge in frozen at minus 18 degrees centigrade uh, instead of thawing it in the water bath you just take it out from the freezer minus 18 and put it in the fridge 1 to 6 degrees centigrade when the unit is thawing slowly the fibrinogen in there will precipitate out and then you separate it out and freeze it right away within, within an hour and put it in minus 18. That is cryoprecipitate. So stored for one year under at minus 18 degrees centigrade. And the shelf life is one year from the collection date, collection of the original product from the collection of, from the one year from the phlebotomy, not the date when you created the cryo. So that's the important thing to remember for cryo. Once you thaw the cryo, it is stored at room temperature, 20 to 24 degrees centigrade, and it has a shelf life of six hours only if it's a single unit or it's a closed system pool. But if it, the units are pooled in an open system, four hour only shelf life. So this is a very important question to remember for cryo. Um, another thing to remember for cryo, cryo's original name was cryoprecipitate AHF antihemophilic factor. It was used to treat hemophilia A patient. So FDA unfortunately still has a requirement that we have at least 80 international units of factor eight in each unit of cryo, but we don't use it for treating hemophilia anymore, but still 80 units factor eight, important question. And what is used for now is fibrinogen. So at least 150 milligrams of fibrinogen in each unit. And that's what you have to remember. I just added granulocytes here because um, I don't want to make an extra slide for granulocyte. So granulocytes collected by apheresis must contain one into 10 to 10 granulocyte. That is an important thing to remember. At least that's the minimum content of granulocyte in a unit stored at room temperature and can be stored shelf life only one day or 24 hours. So these three things to gran for granulocyte, remember these three things. That's all I had for the components, but let's now jump into the some special modifications that we do for the products and what we need to remember. So the First special modification of product that we're going to talk about are volume reduction and splitting. Volume reduction is just removing excess plasma because it opens the bag of unit of regular cells. It is only good for 24 hours after volume reduction and four hours for a platelet light, platelet product. So that's the important thing to remember for volume reduce. Splitting is just making aliquots from a unit and that does not decrease the shelf life. And each aliquot can be transfused similar to uh, the the mother bag that is up over four hours. So the question that will come on the board, what is the maximum amount of time that you have to transfuse a unit of blood once it leaves the blood bank? Important part, once it leaves the blood bank. So once it leaves the blood bank, you have the nursing staff has four hours to complete the transfusion of any blood product, red blood cell, plasma, platelet, cryo, whatever other product. An indication for both volume reduction and splitting is usually to decrease the risk of volume overload. Next special modification, most common one, leukocyte reduce, all the blood products are filtered to reduce white blood cells. <clears throat> important question to remember, important fact to remember, after volume, uh, after leukocyte reduction, red blood cells will contain less. Excuse me, uh, after volume reduction, sorry, after leukocyte reduction, each unit of red blood cells should contain less than 510 to 6 less than 5 million white blood cells. That's the important question to remember. Leukocyte reduction reduces the risk of febrile reactions, actually aluminization and CMV infection. So these are important things to remember for indications. Irradiation, uh, only reason why we irradiate is to prevent transmission associated graft versus host disease. No reason, no other indication for irradiation. So. Uh, if the term you hear term irradiation, the only thing that should come to your mind is transfusion associated graft versus host disease. Never say it's for febrile reaction, HLA or CMB. Irradiation only and only for transfusion associated graft versus host disease. We use gamma or x-rays. And the important question that comes, the, the dose of irradiation that has to be given at least 25 to the center or 15 to the rest of the component or the container. That is the important thing. Shelf life of red blood cell decreased to 28 days or the original expiration date, whichever is earlier, platelet shelf life unchanged. So these are the important questions, the dose and the expiration date. This is the list of 
the patients which are at risk of irradiation, which are at risk of transfusion associated graft versus host disease. Uh, you can remember that, but that's not very important. The important thing is the dosage and the expiration days. Uh, next uh, modification is washing. Washing, you just wash the unit with normal saline, reduce, removes more than 95% of the plasma of the product. So that's the important question. And then the most important thing is to remember the shelf life. The shelf life of a wash product, red blood cell is 24 hours and for a red blood cell or for a platelet is four hours only. So this 95% removal of plasma and shelf life decreased to 24 hours or four hours for platelets is the important thing to remember. And the reason why you do it, anaphylactic reaction, IgA deficiency, um, this question will come. So in NATE, neonatal aluminum thromocytopenia, we provide washed, we can provide washed maternal platelets, but that's not the question that they will ask. They will ask a patient, a neonate has NATE, neonatal aluminum thromocytopenia, has head bleed or is bleeding, we have GI bleed or any other bleeding in the newborn baby, and they urgently need platelet. So we just see maternal washed modern maternal platelet and we try to select that option, but that's the trick question. In urgent need for a patient with NATE, you give random platelet. So that's the important thing to remember. NATE, urgent need for platelet transfusion, give random platelet. You have a lot of time, you're planning a transfusion that might be needed, then wash maternal platelet for NATE is an option. So that's a trick question, remember that. Random platelet for patient at risk of bleeding in NATE. Okay, the next part of our talk, I'm gonna talk about the antibodies, the workups that we do. So let's get into that. Before we go into the specific pre-transfusion testing we do, let's talk a bit about the general guidelines for antibodies that we hear about in blood bank. So commonly you will hear warm antibodies and cold antibodies. Uh, so cold antibodies are the ones which react at room temperature or in the immediate spin testing phase, which I'll talk about in a second. Warm antibodies are the ones react at 37 degree or at the AIG anti-human globulin phase. Uh, usually IgG, IgG are warm, IgM are cold, IgM activates complement, IgM is a big bulky antibody uh, and they uh, they are usually naturally occurring. When we're talking about the ABO antibodies, usually the cold antibodies are considered clinically insignificant because they don't cause hemolytic transfusion reaction. The IgM bulky pentamer does not cross as placenta, so usually does not cause as HD, FN, hemolytic disease of fetus and newborn. On the other side, IgG antibodies, they coat the red blood cell. They don't activate complement. Uh, they are not naturally occurring. They require exposure from previous transfusion or pregnancy. They are usually clinically significant because they cause hemolytic transfusion reaction. And IgGs, which are monomers, they can cross placenta and cause hemolytic disease of fetus and newborn. ABO antibodies, which are IgM cold reacting or emitted spin reacting antibodies naturally occurring, are exception because they can cause significant hemolytic transfusion reaction and there are a anti A comma B, which is the IgG subtype, which can cross placenta and cause HDFN. Uh, and the question that comes up is, which antibodies, which antibody groups uh, causes the most is the most common cause of hemolytic disease of fetus and newborn? It is the ABO antibodies are the most common cause of hemolytic disease of fetus and newborn. Fortunately, these are usually mild hemolytic transfusion reaction, but they are the most common cause of antibody, uh, hemolytic disease of fetus and newborn. Uh, because we are talking about HDFN, I just added a couple of things here. Uh, the critical titers, they usually come up. So in addition to ABO antibodies, all the other LO antibodies, anti-cal, DAFI, and other ones can cause hemolytic disease of fetus and newborn by crossing the placenta. And for them, uh, we, have, we test for titers to identify the risk of fetal anemia. Uh, and the titer cutoff for all the antibodies is 16 or higher, but for CAL, the titer cutoff is 8. CAL is causes severe HDFN, and it causes hyperproliferative anemia because CAL antigens are exposed earlier in the life. Uh, in the fetal red blood cells, CAL antibodies are exposed, and uh, antigens are expressed. So CAL has a lower titer cutoff of 8, and all the other antibodies have a cutoff of 16. Similar to HDFN, where I said the most common antibody involved, antigen antibodies involved is the ABO. Um, I just added this random fact here. 
that for NEAT, neonatal allomene thromocytopenia, which is the most common antigen involved, it is HPA1A, HPA1 or PLA1, human platelet antigen 1 or platelet antigen 1. So this is just a random question that will come up on your boards. So what is the tube that we collect for uh, blood bank testing? It's the pink top EDTA tube. And we separate the plasma and red blood cell because in blood bank testing, we are looking for antigen expression on the red blood cell and we're looking for antibodies in the plasma. Oh, random question here. Leading cause of hemolytic transfusion reaction is misidentification and specimen mislabeling. So pre-analytical errors. So label your tubes properly. This is a question that will come up. What is the leading cause of hemolytic transfusion reaction? Clerical error, uh, pre-analytical error, misidentification, specimen mislabeling. These are the various tests that we perform, ABO typing, RH typing, antibody screen identification, and cross-match. All the testing in the blood bank is based on the principle of hemagglutination that antigen and antibody react with each other, they clump together, and they form a, a clot or the agglutinin. And these are the tests, and these are the various methodology out there, uh, immediate spin, IAT, DAT, which we need to talk a little bit about. So the confusion that people have, the Coombs test, DAT, IAT. So first of all, Coombs test, which is also called anti-globulin test. So Dr. Coombs just found that there were some antibodies which are present, which coat the red blood cells and don't cause agglutination. But on top of that, if you add AHG anti-human globulin or the Coombs reagent, then these red blood cells, which are coated with antibodies already, these other AHG antibodies, IgG antibodies, bring them together and cause visual agglutination. So that's called Coombs test, which is basically what a DAT is. So DAT is Coombs test. So, and it's called direct because we are not doing anything to bring the red blood cell and the antibodies together. They are already coated. We are just adding AHG to bring them together. So Coombs test is the DAT. Uh, then we have the IAT. So, okay, so the purpose of DAT is to find red blood cells which are already coated with antibodies. On the other side, the indirect antiglobulin test or indirect Coombs test. So in this case, antibodies are freely present in the plasma, red cells are not coated. So first you indirectly bring them together, coat the antibodies on the red blood cell surface, then you add AHG and then there's the agglutination is seen. So that's called IAT. This is where, where we are trying to find antibodies in the plasma. So DAT, we are trying to find antibodies already present on red blood cells. IAT, we are trying to find antibodies present in the plasma. Um, antibody typing, I don't think we, I need to go into details of what antibody testing is. Antibody type, ABO typing is forward and reverse. Uh, quotient that randomly shows up, what is the color of antisera? Antisera A is blue in color, antisera B is yellow in color. It would have been easy if B was blue and A was yellow but A is blue, B is yellow. Just remember this fact. Um, RHD typing, the RHD antisera does not have any color, so they don't ask you on that. There is no reverse typing on D typing. Um, so both ABO and RH typing are done in immediate spin. Antibody screen is the IAT test. We are trying to identify antibody present in the plasma. And same is the antibody panel, identification panel. We are trying to identify the, the, the antibody that is present in plasma. So we'll come back to, there are a few antigrams, antibody panels that show up on your board. So we'll come to them at the end of this presentation and we'll see how to solve these panels. How do you do the rules in and rule outs during the board exams? So we'll come back to that. Um, at the end, after all the workup, ABO typing, antibody screen are done, then you have to cross match the units to the patient. So, which is called serological cross match, but you don't always have to do a serological cross match. You can do electronic cross match if the patient does not have any, if their antibody screen is negative and they don't have any history of ABO antibody. So electronic cross match that can be questioned when it can be done, when the antibody screen is negative and patient has no previous history of antibodies, you can do a electronic cross match. Okay. Uh, some random questions about the things that we do during these workups. So there are some potentiating agents which increase the interaction between red blood cell and antibodies and in increase the efficiency of agglutination. So the products, the potentiating agents that are used are LIS and PEG. So LIS is called low ionic strength solution of saline. 
and PAG is called polyethylene glycol. So how does LIS works? LIS works by decreasing zeta potential. So that's the question. How does the potentiating agent LIS works? Decreases zeta potential. How does the potentiating agent PAG works? It works by causing steric exclusion, removing water around the red blood cells. So PAG works by steric exclusion of water. LIS works by decreasing zeta potential. So these are the questions that will show up on the board. And what is a potentiating agent? It is the agent which increases the interaction between red blood cell and antibodies and makes them makes agglutination more efficient. Uh, enzyme treatment. So sometimes when we are trying to rule in and rule out antibodies, we take the red blood cell panel the, and the screening cells and we treat them with enzymes, which increases or decreases the exp uh, exposure of the, uh, of the specific antigens. Um, and these can sometimes show up on the board. So which are the antigens which are enhanced, which are the destroyed by enzyme treatment? So Lewis, ABO, RH, and KID are enhanced. They're like if we have enzyme treatment cell, treated cell, the reactivity of these cells will increase uh, with the their interaction with antibodies will increase and they will become stronger. And Duffy, Lutheran, MNS, and Cheeto are destroyed. Cal, Diago, and Colton, mainly the Cal is unaffected. That's the one that you have to remember. What happens to Cal? Cal is not impacted by the enzyme treatment, but Cal is destroyed by DTT. That's the question that will show up on the board. Um, then there are these antibody neutralizing substances. So these are the substances that bind to the antibodies and remove them. Uh, so these are weird substances that you have to remember the name. So SDA, guinea pig urine, P1, hydrated cyst, and pigeon eggs, saliva, H and Lewis A, breast milk, big eye, plasma, Cheeto and Roger. Just remember these neutralizing substances. So these just bind to the antibodies and remove them. Next things are the lectins. The compared to the neutralizing substance, lectins bind to the antigens. So these lectins are like antibodies themselves because they go and bind to the antigens. So the most common one you have to remember is Dolichus biflorus, which is for A1. So I've given an example here. So if a red blood cell binds to A1, sorry, that, if the patient's red blood cell react with Dolichus biflorus, then that donor tie is A1, that patient is A1. If this reaction is negative, that might mean that patient might be A2 or other subtype. So Dolichus biflorus for A1 is an important one. Ulex euphorius for H is an important one. Uh, Vicia gramia for N is important, but Dolichus biflorus and Ulex euphorius for H, these are the two are the most important one to remember. <clears throat> um, in the antibody panels, you see a dosage effect. What it means is if there is a red blood cell, test red blood cell, which is homozygous, the antibodies will react strongly with that. If the cell is homo heterozygous, the antibody will react weakly. So Kid, Duffy are the most common one which show dosage, but then these are the other ones. Uh, as you can see in the cell here, the cell one, which is a homozygous for a JKA, reacts strongly. Cell two, which is heterozygous for JKA, reacts weakly for anti-JKA antibody. Um, okay, then there are some random things that you can, those will be tested on the board. So you have a patient which types of type O, everything looks good, but then you take a unit of red blood cell, which is type O and give to the patient and the patient has, the unit is found to be incompatible. So there's a type O patient, but the unit of red blood cell is incompatible. This could be a Bombay phenotype where the patient does not express his H antigen because they don't have H antigen, they don't have A or B antigen, and they also form anti-H antibody, which will react with all the red blood cells, and I, like A cell, B cell, B, O red blood cell. So the unfortunately, Bombay phenotype patients can only get blood from other Bombay phenotype patients. Uh, weak D versus partial D usually shows up. So weak D is usually tested as RH positive, partial D usually tested as RH negative. There are mutations which are on the intracellular or transmembrane part, which decreases the insertion, insertion of RHD uh, so there is a decreased exposure, ex there is decreased expression of weak D, which is a quantitative defect. In partial D, there are some epitopes of, of D antigen that are missing. So that's why weak D patients don't make anti-D, partial D make anti-D. Genotyping is needed to differentiate weak D versus partial D because it is not as simple as I have put this in the table here. Uh, 
weak D testing is a misnomer. It does not differentiate weak D versus partial D. Uh, question that will come, where do you perform weak D? Infants for a RH negative woman and for blood donors. Weak D testing not recommended for other patients. So where is weak D performed? Infants and blood donors. That's all you have to remember for the both. And weak D is a quantitative defect. Partial D is a qualitative defect. Weak D patients usually don't make anti-D. Partial D patients may make anti-D. Um, other random things that will show up, uh, are null. Patients don't express any, any RH antigen. So there is a loss of RHAG antigen uh, or gene, which prevents insertion of any RH protein. Uh, these patients have stomatocyte. So RH null, stomatocyte, loss of RHAG, and no RH antigens. Uh, Macleod phenotype uh, associated with Cal. So the patient does not have KX antigen. There is deletion of XK gene. Uh, there is a reduced expression of Cal antigen. These patients usually show a canthocyte, and these may also be associated with this X-linked association with chronic granulomatous disease and muscular dystrophy and retinitis pigmentosa. So Macleod phenotype or syndrome. Then there is acquired B. So A antigen has at the end an acetyl galactose and the B antigen has a galactose. Sometimes when there is a bacterial infection, bacteremia, which has deacetylase enzyme, cleaves the N-acetyl group. So now remove the acetyl. So the A antigen has now a N-galactose, which is very similar to galactose. So the patient can have acquired B phenotype. This is what they'll, they will forward type weekly as B but you can resolve it by using monoclonal anti-B agent, which does not interfere, or acidifying the serum. G antigen, which is a combination antigen, which is present whenever there is a D or C antigen present, there is a G antigen present. Anti-G is rare, but if anti-G antibody is present, it could be anti-G itself, or it could be anti-C and anti-D antibodies, which will also look like anti-G on the panel. Important to figure out if it's an anti-G or anti-C and anti-D because if the woman has anti-G, she does not, she does need RHIG. But if the female, pregnant female has anti-D, she is already sensitized, does not need RHIG. Lewis, important thing to remember for Lewis, if the patient is non-secreted, the only antigen they will express is Lewis A, uh, Norwal, virus, and H. pylori attached to Lewis A antigen on the red blood cell surface. Uh, during pregnancy, Lewis antigens are, the expression decreases because these are passively absorbed on the red blood cell surface. So these are the facts to remember for Lewis. Uh, next one is big eye antigen. Important thing to remember for big eye antigen, autoantibodies are common and uh, infection associated with big eye, big anti-eye, mycoplasma in adults, and in the kids, anti-small eye associated with EBB infectious mononucleosis. P antigen or P1 antigen, you have to remember it is associated with parvovirus infection, uh, pigeon and hydrated cyst fluids. These are so patients which don't, uh, yeah, patients which are handling pigeon eggs or have hydrated cyst disease will have anti P antibody. And these are the neutralizing compounds, this, which are, these are the compounds which pigeon egg white and hydrated cyst fluid neutralize the P antigen. Association with paroxysmal cold hemoglobin urea, P antigen, anti-P is the donut lens standard, which is a biphasic hemolysin, uh, which binds to red blood cell at cold temperature, fixes complement, and dissociates upon warming. Kid antibodies shows dos dosage, can disappear over time, good at fixing complement, which is rare for IgG, but can antibody fixes complement, can cause severe de hem delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. Um, yeah, these are the things you have to remember. Dosage disappears over time and causes delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction for kid antibody. Duffy antibody, patients which don't express Duffy antigen are resistant to malaria, Vivex, and Noleski. Uh, these are the important things to remember for Duffy. MNS system, um, located on glycophorin A and B, glycophorin A, MNS, M and N, and glycophorin B, S, small s and U. Uh, important question, anti-S is almost always IgM and usually not clinically significant. IgM can be IgM or IgG. Um, yeah, these are the things to remember. Oh, GPA, 
assist in plasmodium falciparum. So GPA, MNN antigens has helped with plasmodium falciparum infection. This is a slide for <clears throat> HDFN and RHIG. So if a pregnant female who is RH negative marries a father well, who is RH positive, the baby can be RH positive. And if the female is RH negative, baby is RH positive, there is a risk of 16% risk of sensitization that is patient forming anti-D antibody, which in future pregnancies can cause hemolytic disease of fetus and newborn. As I mentioned, ABO is the most common cause of HDFN, but it's usually mild, but severe HDFN can be caused by anti-D antibodies and CAL antibodies. Uh, so for anti-D, as I said, there is 16% risk of sensitization, but if the patient receive RHIG, ROGAM, ROFLEC, or others at 28 weeks, the risk of sensitization decreases to 1%, and if it's second dose of RHIG is given postpartum, the risk decreases to 0.1%. Um, the question that will come, the calculation for RHIG, so you have to either, you have to quantify the fetal maternal hemorrhage, which can be done by Clyhor stain, or by flow cytometry. So you will not be asked to calculate those. So the answer, you will be given how much fetal maternal bleed happened or the percentage of uh, fetal cells found by Clower stain or by flow cytometry. And then you multiply it by maternal blood to get the actual amount of blood that was uh, fetal maternal hemorrhage that happened. So usually you just assume the maternal blood volume to be 5,000 they will not give you like height and weight to make you calculate the maternal blood volume. They will either give it to you or just you assume the blood volume of the mom is five liters uh, and you multiply the percentage of the, the fetal cells to get the ML. So once you get the fetal maternal hemorrhage, then you can calculate the number of vials that are needed. So the question that you have to remember, what is the content of each vial of ROGAM? or RHIG, each vial contains 300 microgram or 1500 international unit of RHIG. And then how much does that covers? So each vial covers 30 mLs of fetal maternal hemorrhage. Very rarely they can say, what is the red blood cell only volume? But usually fetal maternal hemorrhage is happening in the whole blood. So 30 mL of fetal maternal hemorrhage is covered by each vial. So each vial contains 30 uh, covers 30 ml of fetal maternal hemorrhage. Each unit, each vial contains 300 microgram or 1500 international units. So you divide that. So first of all, the calculation, simplified calculation, if you're giving the percentage, you just multiply it by five by three and you get the number of vials uh, because each vial color covers 30 ml. But wait, that's not it. You need to add the safety factor. So whatever number you get for the number of vials, you have to round um, round it up and add one or two, depending on the decimal point. So if you get 1.1, 1.2, then you round it up and add one more. If you get 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, you round it up and add two. So if the calculation comes 2.2, you give three vials. 2.5, you give four vials. 2.9, you give four vials. So ROGAM calculation, Remember the simple formula and then don't forget to round up. I am so in this talk, I was not able to cover much of the therapeutic aphoresis, but I just added a couple of the slides. So these are the categories, ASFA categories that you have to remember. And grading, grading is not very important, but ASFA categories, what is the ASFA category one? That is aphoresis a disorder for which apheresis is the first line of treatment. Category two, where the apheresis is the second line of treatment. Category three, optimal role is not established. Category four, apheresis does not help or it can even harm. So category of ESFA guideline for therapeutic apheresis is very important to remember. Grading, not so important. Um, and then I just added what are the common category one, two, three indications. So TTP, plasma exchange, category one. Hyperviscosity, myosinic gravis, uh, CIDP, renal transplant, AMR, category one indication for plasma exchange, liver transplant, heart transplant, AMR, category three indication for plasma exchange. And then for other procedure, LDL, apheresis, category one, familial hypercholesterolemia, sickle cell disease, acute stroke, category one, sickle cell disease, stroke prophylaxis, category one, uh, hyperleukocytosis in le acute leukemia, 
category three thrombocytosis, category two photophoresis, GVHD, acute or chronic category two, CTLV, Sazerac syndrome, category one. So these are just the common ones that you might have to remember, but very important to remember the ASPA categories one, two, three, four. Okay, we are getting towards the end of the talk. So we will just go over some antigrams to, to figure out how are we gonna solve these antigrams in the boards. So the first example that I have, I just have three, uh, which we'll go over. So this antigram that I have here, question will be something like which antibody is present, anti DEKL, JKA, or anti Duffy A. So how would we solve this? Are we gonna do rule ins and rule out? No, never do a rule in rule out in the exam. You will not have enough time to do that and you should never do that. Look at the answers and try to match the pattern. So let's look at each one of them. Anti D, well, this one they have the RXL so they didn't even give you D specifically so you don't have to worry about it. Anti Cal, let's look at the K cells. So cal first cell, cell number one is K positive but the cell number one is negative. Uh, cell number six is Cal positive and it's also negative. And cell number seven is positive, and it, that's also positive, but the two Cal positive cells are not reacting, so does not match the pattern for Cal. JKA, JKA right here, first cell, second cell matches, that makes sense, but then there are cell number three and four, which are JKA positive, not reacting. Uh, then there are another cell number five, which is also reacting, so the pattern with JKA also does not matches. But let's now look at the FYA. All the cells which are FYA positive are also positive. So the answer is anti Duffy A. So never rule in or rule out, don't perform the antibody testing during the during the board exam. Um, okay, then the next antigram that I have here. So over here, the options are anti D and small c, warm auto antibody, HDLA, high title, low avidity, auto anti small e. So in this uh, in this panel, you are seeing all the cells are positive, including the patient cell. So when you have something like that, that is a uh, telltale sign for you that is a warm autoantibody. So if the, all the cells are positive and patient cell is positive, this is a warm autoantibody. Anti D and small c, uh, if you look at big D, this could be multiple antibodies, but in that case, autoantibody, the patient cell should not be positive. So if the patient cell was negative here, then it could be D and small c, but in this case, not an option. HDLA, high title, low avidity, could also be an option if the patient cell was negative. Auto anti small e, uh, there are one cell which is should have been negative in that case, and the patient cell would be positive in that scenario. So, but they will not give you that complicated panels, but patient cell positive and all the cells positive, that's a sign for warm auto antibody. Then the third panel that we have here, uh, cell number, these three cells, four, five, five cells are positive uh, in ARG phase. So the options they have is K and FEA, anti K, anti small s, anti K and E. So let's look at some of them. So let's do the simple one first, like small s. So small s is right here. The small s first cell is negative. Uh, so it does not look like that. Third cell positive, fourth cell positive, fifth cell positive, sixth cell is S positive, but the panel is negative. So it does not match the, 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 and there are a couple more cells which are negative down here. So pattern does not explain, is not explained by small s. Uh, Cal, let's look at the Cal. Cal also, some cells make sense. The, the, the cell three and four make sense. Then five is negative. Uh, then this another cell is Cal positive. So there are a couple of cells which are Cal negative, which are also positive. So Cal alone also does not make sense. So it is a combination of multiple antibodies most likely. So let's see what it could be. So when we try to look at the panel, then we find that the pattern matches for Cal plus Duffy A. That can be explained by this reactivity that we are seeing. But the question that might come is, oh, there are a bunch of Duffy A cells which are positive and the panel is negative. What you're seeing here is a dosage effect. Whenever there's a heterozygous cell for Duffy A, those are negative. Whenever there is a homozygous cell for Duffy, it is positive. So that's the dosage that you are seeing in this case. So yeah, these are the simple panels that will usually show up in your board. Three to five panels you can expect. Never solve, try to solve them. Just try to look at the pattern and see if it makes any sense. 
Okay, that's all I had for today. Um, I do see there is one question on the chat. Uh, question is non-pregnant female for platelet Y. Uh, and do you mean somebody who has never been pregnant or currently not pregnant? So for platelets and plasma donations, uh, this is for reducing the risk of, uh, this is called trolley mitigation. So for patients, uh, trolley is transfusion associated acute lung injury. So sorry, I didn't cover any of the transfusion reactions today. So trolley is caused by anti-HLA or HNA antibody that might be present in the donor. So females, pregnant females have risk of having HLA antibodies, which puts the patient at risk of trolley. So under the trolley mitigation, any female patient which, who has been pregnant cannot donate unless they are tested for HLA antibodies. And if their HLA antibodies are negative, then they can donate platelet or plasma. Uh, do you mean somebody who has never been pregnant or currently not pregnant? Yeah, that's what I mean. So somebody who has not been pregnant can donate or if they have been previously pregnant, then they can do it. Uh, so the next question I have here on the chat is for electronic cross match while verifying for the criteria to be met, how confident we how confident do we put in the clinical notes for historical records provided in patients who are transferred from outside facility? So, uh, yes, we try our best to see if the patient, we can get outside records and if the patient has been transfused, but yes, like, we just try our best. But if we don't have any previous history or if you are suspicious that patient has a history of AML or something which you think that clinically this patient might have been transfused at outside hospital, then to be on the safe side, you should do serological cross match. But for a patient which has never, which you are quite sure and you have tried your best to reach out to other hospitals in the area, uh, then you can do electronic cross match. It's usually for patients which, who have never, who are new patients who have never been transfused. My second question is, if you could comment on four main categories of therapeutic apheresis, category one to four. Absolutely, let's go back to them. Uh, Okay. I know I rushed on these therapeutic apheresis guidelines. Uh, so that's why American Society for Apheresis publishes these guidelines every three to four years. So they have divided the therapeutic apheresis indications into four categories. So for the category one, category two, category three, category four, so when therapeutic apheresis, any of the procedure, red cell exchange, plasma exchange, uh, white cell reduction or platelet reduction or ECP, if we are performing that procedure for a diagnosis where it is the first line of treatment or a standalone primary treatment, that is called category one. So example will be plasma exchange for TTP. So in plasma exchange for TTP patient, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura patient, as soon as you suspect the diagnosis, you start plasma exchange as first line of therapy. So that will be category one. Category two will be indication where plasma exchange is important or other therapeutic procedures are important and they should be started ASAP, but they are not the first line of therapy. They are started in conjugation with other therapies uh, or st sometimes standalone, but these are second line of therapy. Category three is where the role of apheresis is not established. Like it might help or might not help, but the evidence out there is not great. So decision-making is individualized. Most of the time we do perform the procedure, uh, but we don't know if it's gonna help or not. Category four is where we know that this plasma exchange or red cell exchange is not gonna help the evidence that is out there, the control trial, randomized control trial, or, uh, or the, case reports, case series have shown that plasma exchange or red selection or any other apheresis for that particular diagnosis does not help or even can harm the patient, then that is called category four. And in that case, if the clinician is pushing you to perform those procedure, IRB or ethics committee should be involved for a category four indication. The grading that is out there, grading 1A, 1B, 1C is for where there is evidence to support performing that procedure uh, to be done, but the, the evidence is one eight evidences. That's a great evidence, multiple randomized control trial. One B is strong evidence, but 
quality is not that great. We have some randomized control trial or non-randomized trials. Categories 1C will be, grading 1C will be, there are just some case reports and case series to support performing that procedure. A 2A, 2B, 2C is like weak recommendation and similar evidence behind each one of them. Okay, the would not the same antibodies by plasma. Uh, what's the question? The next question is, would not PRBC also contain same antibodies by plasma is low, but no level? Yes, it will have some antibody, but there is not as much. So the trolley is definitely more based on the exposure, amount of exposure. So that's why red blood cells can cause trolley, but you cannot, uh, you have to look into risk and benefit of any any additional testing that you want to do. So if you were to test all the donors for HLA antibodies, you're gonna increase the cost and slow down the process for collecting blood significantly. <clears throat> but, but you are right that red blood cells also have some plasma and can cause trolley. But as of right now, FDA just requests us to do to donate uh, to do HLA testing on plasma and platelet donors because those are at the high risk of causing trolley. Donor criteria, which is correct, 56 days denial or 110 days. Different textbook maker. In US, if you are donating a unit of whole blood, you are deferred for 56 days or eight weeks. Uh, that's the FDA requirement in US. 110 days, I'm not sure where the 110 days come, but if you're donating a double red, which you can do by donating red blood cell in apheresis, then you can you are deferred for 16 weeks. So for red blood cells, whole blood donation, 56 days or eight weeks, double red, which can be donated by apheresis, 16 weeks. So that's the F US requirement. How to differentiate trolley from TACO? What is the breast criteria? Uh, it's a clinical diagnosis. It's very difficult. Like we are not covering the transfusion reactions here, but Trali and TACO are mostly clinical diagnosis. <clears throat> In clinical setting, TACO will respond to diuretic treatment. Uh, so patient will get better with removing excess water, but Trali patient is not gonna get better with giving diuretics. Uh, neonatal alumin thrombocytopenia, the most common cause is predominantly HPA1A, correct? Are there some rare cases that HPA1A negative nate? Yes, definitely there are but most of the time we don't test for them. It's very rare that you will go and test for HPA1A antibodies other than HPA1A. And yeah, so there are other ones, but HPA1A is the most common one. Okay, any other questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Matra. I think these are the questions that I see online on mm -hmm. Facebook and YouTube. Uh, if there is any other question from the viewers, can you please, uh, I request the viewers to text on the chat box. Oh, there is one. Let me uh, read that for you. Uh, the question is, uh, one second. It says, for one unit of cryo, minimal amount of fibrinogen and factor eight are 150 milligram or eight and 80 international unit respectively. Is that correct? 80 international units for factor eight, 150 milligram minimum for fibrinogen for cryo. Yes. Let me go to that slide quickly. Uh, yes. So each unit of cryo should contain at least 80 international units of factor eight and at least 150 milligrams of fibrinogen in each cryo unit. And that's a single bag, single bag of cryo, not the pooled. Okay, I think, uh, let me check if there is any other question. Um, oh no, there is one more. Let me read it for you. Uh, in malaria infection, there is a lot of criteria for donation. Please tell us the WHO criteria after malaria infection. That is, how long should we wait? So once you are diagnosed with malaria and you are recovered, you have to wait for three years to donate in US. That's the requirement in US that after malaria infection is you have recovered, you don't have any symptoms, you have to wait for three years after diagnosis of malaria. If you come from a country which is endemic for malaria, like I came from you in from India and you have lived there for more than five years. So once I came to US, I could not donate for three years. Uh, 
And if I go back to India in between, that time period starts again. So I had to live in US for consecutive three years before I could donate blood products in US. And if you are a US citizen who have always lived in US and you go to a malaria endemic country, like you go to India and you come back, you did not have malaria or anything, but just because you went to a malaria endemic country, you have to wait for three months to donate. So this is the deferral for malaria. I think this is a very good uh, point that uh, was asked and then that you repeated again. I mean, and uh, and this chart is really helpful, it seems, because if somebody is from a malaria endemic country, then even if that person goes back, so then the clock starts from zero. Starts again. Right? Yes, that starts again. That happened to me for first two years that I was visiting every year, mm -hmm. uh, going back to India again. So that happened. Somebody asked about the Lewis. I know Lewis. I didn't talk much about the genetics of all the blood products either. But yes, like those are important one to remember. Let me find that Lewis slide quickly. Uh, where's Lewis here? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, like I was looking at the clock and I like rushed through this Lewis slide. So the Lewis genetics. So Lewis, so you have type one gene, which if you, there's a Lewis gene LA gene, which converts the type 1 chain into Lewis A antigen. And then there's a secretor gene, which converts type 1 gene into H gene. And then when the Lewis gene works on the H chain, then the Lewis B antigen is formed. So if a donor, if a, sorry, a patient does not have secretor gene, so that will, what I meant here, patient is donor or patient is non-secretor, they will never form the Lewis B. So that's why the question is, if a patient is not a secretor, they will only have Lewis A. Uh, then, but they go through the secretor gene pathway, then they can form the Lewis B. So that's the that's the genetics, quick genetics of Lewis antigen. Uh, there is a similar chart I couldn't. So the, I would give Doctor Joe Sheffin, the blood bank guy, credit for stealing his slide here. Uh, he has great lecture on that he is at Loma Linda University now. So watch his lecture on blood bank guy, which he explained all these things in detail. Uh, there is a similar genetics chart for ABO antigens also, which you might have to remember a little bit. Another genetics that you have to remember is for the RH, uh, various type of nomenclature for RH, which I didn't go over in this talk. So those are other things that you might have to uh, spend some time and remember for the boats. Okay, one more question. Currently, is there any deferral for blood donors who have COVID-19 and other variants? So yes, so if you have COVID, uh, COVID infection, you are deferred uh, until you recover. And for, I think it's a two weeks, two weeks deferral after, uh, after COVID infection. It's a two week deferral, yes, for COVID infection. Yeah. Uh... I think Dr. Mathur, I don't see any other question. Let me double check before uh, one. I think these are all the questions uh, that that were asked. But thank you, Dr. Mathur, for this amazing lecture. And in this such a short time, you uh, did such a comprehensive coverage of all the uh, high yield topics in transfusion medicine, which is such a vast uh, subject in itself. And uh, I mean, and I mean, I know, like, I mean, it would be uh, difficult to cover everything, but still, like, thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. You would be happy to know that we had a lot of viewers who joined from different countries. I could uh, keep track of our colleagues who joined from places as far as Myanmar, Mexico, Pakistan, India, Argentina, Philippines, Saudi Arabia, Ukraine, Bangladesh, to name a few. And wow. uh, thanks to our viewers for your uh, continued support. And uh, if you like our lectures, please don't forget to follow podcast on our social media platforms on Facebook. You can follow on YouTube. You can uh, uh, subscribe to our channel so that you can stay updated. And we have an account on Instagram as well as on X. So this, this will help you to stay updated with the upcoming lectures. And our next talk is actually tomorrow. So that is, we will switch our gear, and this would be a talk on interoperative pathology. And we will have a very uh, relevant talk on 
the challenges that we face in interoperative or frozen section consultation of head and neck pathology. And our speaker is Dr. Alice Sandra Smith. She will be joining from Mayo Clinic, Arizona. So it's the same time at 9 p.m. Pacific. So hope to see you at that time tomorrow. And thank you again, Dr. Matra. This was amazing. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Dr. Manan.